by Krom. This is it. The final Savage Sword of Conan Omnibus from Marvel Comics. So, let's take a look at this together. Before getting started, I want to give a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and book market on October 18th or 19th, depending on where you get your books. And speaking of direct market, book market, what we're looking at here is the standard edition cover by Nick Klein. On the left-hand side is your direct market cover by the legendary Bill Sienkiewicz. That is the cover to issue 102. Everything else is identical. And of course, direct market covers, you can only get through places like CheapGraphicNovels.com, WaltzComicShop.com, Dying Breed Collectors, ECBS, In Stock Trade, your local comic book shop, Organic Price Books, Tales of Wonder, places like that. This one here, though, is available everywhere. So here it is, The Last Savage Short of Conan Omnibus. For now, maybe in a few years, who knows what will happen with the license. Uh, it breaks my heart because... I started this journey with, well, of course, I can't, like most people my age probably started this journey with the Schwarzenegger movies and then the cartoons and then I got to read the Robert E. Howard novels, but the comics journey really began with uh, the Kurt Busiek run. Matter of fact, that series right there, that's the one that began the journey for me with Conan the Barbarian. Um, let's come back to this though. Uh, here's the back cover with all the covers, including the Bill Sienkiewicz cover. The retail price of the book is $150. Mature content, for sure. I love this marble look. Too. I've always loved the design of these books. We got to even look at the spine a little bit closer. So here's the Savage Sword of Conan, the original Marvel years. And then you have most of the creators that are involved in this particular volume right there. The writers and artists. And then underneath the dust jacket... But what I was going to say, even though my journey began with the Dark Horse run and then I fell in love with Roy Thomas's uh, Conan the Barbarian, the original Marvel years when I read it for the first time in omnibus format, I came and read this. I read the modern stuff. I read the Sumerian comic that Ablaze is putting out. And after it's all said and done, I think my favorite Conan stories have come out of the Savage Sword era. This is the black and white era that was originally printed in magazine format to avoid the comics code. Uh, they could put mature content in there. And we're going to look at that and reminisce a little bit. Uh, but yes, this is what underneath the dust jacket looks like. Identical to what the others have looked like. The same design. Damn, I'm going to miss that design. Um, but let's crack this open. Talk about some of the stories in here. Check out the artwork. And like I said, take a walk down memory lane. All right, let's open this up. Here's your end paper. And Savage Sword of Conan. The original Marvel Years, Volume 8. Michael, uh, Michael Fleischer, Larry Yakata, Gary Kopis, who does the introduction here. Ernie Chan, Val Meyerick, Rudy Nebedes, and Dave Simmons. Names you're probably familiar with if you were reading this era, or just early comic book readers or... Uh, how do I put this? Um, aged comic book readers, if you will. But aged like a fine wine. All right. So here's the people behind the scenes here. For the help put the book together. And I have always loved the table of contents. I think this is some of the best table of contents that they have done um, at Marvel for books. I, I love the look of it. It looks so classy. It looks like it was just edged in stone. And I never really talked about it as much, and I guess it's because I'm going to miss this stuff. But here we have Volume 8, uh, Collecting Issues 102 to 116, and Marvel Comics Super Special 35, which I can't wait to talk about. The writers right here, mainly Michael Fleischer, uh, Larry Akata doing a few issues, and then you have some of the, like, the backups back here. Uh, the illustrations... Uh, you have Dave Simmons, uh, Rudy Nebres, Gary Quapis, Ernie Chan. And they're usually uh, giving credit to those for the front pieces, the end pieces. And you'll see uh, when I'm looking through here. Here's a paint up. Uh, uncanny Omar Talk Pretty one day. Uh, pencilers and layouts, inkers, letters, colorists, managing editors. Editors at the time was Larry Hama. 
the collection cover art, the variant cover art, and then, of course, Conan created by Robert E. Howard. And look at that. Look at all those pages. My goodness. This, this is a big book. I mean, this book is probably the biggest sort of Conan book. Uh, it retails for $150. Uh, this one has 1,056 pages. I want to say Volume 1 had over 1,000, but I don't think it had 1,056 pages. So here's an introduction. It's an interesting introduction because um, I'm used to these historical takes on these books, like what some of the behind-the-scenes stories are behind the stories. Uh, this one here is by Gary Quapis. We talked about being an artist. We talked about being a... Uh, he was an art school dropout and lived in the New York area and for some reason never bothered to go... Oh, no, not for some reason. This is funny. I never thought I would see this in an introduction. Uh, but he talked about why he never took an interest in Marvel Comics, why he didn't want to go and pursue a job there as an artist. And it's basically because of superheroes. And I have never thought... I would see this, but he, he just says, I'd just never been a big fan. To me, superheroes were like PewDiePie. What? Uh, incredibly popular for reasons I will never fully appreciate. Not dogging on anybody that liked superhero stuff, but that was just an interesting comparison in a Conan introduction. Uh, but it is really cool how he gives... Uh, Love to his guardian angel because he was showing his artwork to Larry Hama. And Larry Hama's like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this crap? Calling his artwork crap. And it, it, when you read the introduction, you know, you could put yourself in his shoes and you could have handled that way. I get, You could have handled that story two or three different. You could have handled that reaction to your art two or three different ways. And I think he took it the best way possible. Uh, of course, the map that they do in every one of these and the covers with the text. So you have Savage Order Conan 102. When it came out, July 1984. And of course, this is the direct market cover that they used. So this here has an interesting collection of stories because I I can see when people always told me, yeah, I'm done with Conan after Roy Thomas leaves or John Buscema left. And much like the original Marvel years, I feel like... This, to me, reading it for the first time, has really helped me appreciate these stories. It's To me, this has been my nice breath of fresh air from reading, not mundane superhero stories, but when you read a lot uh, for, the, for the channel, for example, you know, the stories tend to get a little repetitive. And I think that was people's issues with Conan, that stories tended to get repetitive. And I can see that. But to me, it was just like... Let's go back and see some sword kicking ass action because that's exactly what I expect out of this. And the mature themes that you're going to mainly find in here is a little more violence and, of course, a little more nudity. Never really male nudity, it's always female nudity. So that's that was always the thing with Conan. That's how they got a lot of young guys, a lot of young boys uh, to pick up the comic. You know, they knew their target audience, but. You'll always find Conan wrestling around with some young lady, usually, and then going on some sort of ass-kicking adventure. Again, the covers are intact, the uh, front pieces are all there, the letter pages where they don't hide away from the letter pages when people are complaining about the mundane stories. Issue 102 was pretty interesting, I didn't really talk about it. This is like Conan i haven't really seen before it's like he he loses a fight so that one is a pretty interesting story uh and then the rest of the omnibus you know ups and downs as far as like the artwork sometimes i believe this is pablo marcos uh, that does the pencils for this yeah this is pablo marcos doing the pencils for this depending on who the inker is you know sometimes the art just looks completely phenomenal a lot of strong line work and yeah, I like this stuff right here. The backup stories are great. This one's a really interesting story because this is the story of uh, the treachery of Grey Wolf. And it uh, brings back a character that we saw in the previous volume. Or maybe it was in volume six? No, it was the previous volume. So it's just pretty much another dimension. So Conan is now going through different dimensions and... He's going to a place that is being ruled by King Konar. And King Konar looks like Conan the Barbarian. 
And in this particular story, it's all about how King Konar's lady, Zenoria, was kidnapped, and now he needs Conan's help to go and get her. He's brought to this dimension by Grey Wolf, another character that he had previously met. Uh, this one had a lot of twists and turns and a lot of planning that went the wrong way. So he's not the only character that comes back. King Konar isn't. Um, you also the re see the return of a couple of other villains in here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. He was a villain at first and now he's one of the good guys. Uh, but you see the return of, let me see if I can find this guy, Captain Borak Sharak. I like the, his designs. Yeah, this guy right here. So he makes a return here. He had previously, well, been diminished in a story, and then in this particular story, he comes back in some way. I always liked his design. He's creepy. I like dudes with masks like that. They're men very menacing, mainly because you can't see what their facial expressions look like, so you don't know what they're thinking exactly. And I think they make really good villains for Conan. Again, this is what some of the artwork looks like with lots of just kick-ass action. Uh, you have... Savage Short of Conan 107 up here, for example, and then the month and year that it came out. And when the these were originally published, they, of course, were published in magazine-sized books. So these have been trimmed down a little bit. Just something to keep in mind. When you're reading this and wondering why they even have a border. Uh, but there's also the return of another villain, which we knew was going to come back because um, he shows up later on in the... Marvel Comics Conan books. That is the Devour of Souls. I love this story, The Dinner Guest. This is a silent issue. It's just Conan escaping a bunch of thugs and he wrecks this family's. It's just a couple, not really a family. Their dinner time and he's just kicking the crap out of these guys that are trying to kill him. And meanwhile, <laughs> the old man is like, turns out cheering for him, like, yeah. I don't know what it is about that particular story, but I really enjoyed. Issue 111 here has the Iron uh, Damsels, I believe is what they're going as. Or I almost said Iron Maidens, but that's that can't be the thing. Uh, this is the Iron Damsels, and yes, the covers are uh, pretty interesting because you see tigers with boobs. There's a reason for that. But yes, this is the story where he's introduced to the Iron Damsels. And yes, this group of ladies right there. And it's a storyline that lasts about three, I think, three issues. I love this cover. This is a Joe uh, Jusco cover. It's just the cover to issue number 112. I love it just because it reminds me of King Conan, the ending of, or not King Conan, uh, Conan the Destroyer. I love that ending. So, as a matter of fact, let's talk about what's collected in here uh, for Conan the Destroyer. So, this is really cool. Much like in Volume 6, they have the Marvel Comics Super Special number 35 is an adaptation of Conan the Destroyer. And it is just so nice to see who, you know, has become my favorite Conan artist, and that is John Buscema come back. So here are the credits to Conan the Destroyer, the movie, including Will Chamberlain and Grace, Grace Jones. And then you have the credits to the comic adaptation. So big John Buscema, Michael Flasher. Now, John, John Buscema does the finishes and everything for the first part. The second part, he's finished and inked by other uh, people. Now, the thing that I love about this, much like the first movie adaptation, <clears throat> is that jo big John Buscema didn't give a crap what the characters look like in the movie. He was going to draw them the way he's always drawn Conan. Conan was his Conan. He didn't look anything like Arnold Schwarzenegger, this is uh, the character of Will Chamberlain. He's just like, yeah, I'm going to draw him the way I draw Conan. Nobody tells Big John what to do. I mean, this was his baby. This is what he loved doing. So I appreciate that, that he didn't make the characters look, oh my goodness, I had a big crush on Olivia Dabo right there. Who she, I think she was a British actress. Oh, my goodness. I brought back memories. Woo! Where the hell was I? Okay, uh, yeah, this is part two. So the breakdowns is, are done by John Buscema, and then you have Bob Camp, Charles Vess, how did I forget that name, and Pat Redding doing the finishes. Again, looking the way that Conan characters looked by John Buscema, not the way their movie counterparts looked. And I appreciate that. I love that about adaptations like this, because I can't imagine nowadays like doing an adaptation of a, of a movie and not making the artist make those characters look like the movie 
actors. There's lots of extras in this one here. Uh, there's the Super Special 35. And this is still when rumors were going around that there was going to be a third Conan movie. Oh, that would have been awesome. Uh, it's still a rumor that there might be a King Conan one day, though, with Arnold back. Here's the comic book covers. And then the portfolio pieces. This is a piece by Bill, uh, Billy Graham. Well, I always liked his uh, rough art. I liked it. it. It fits Conan. Wish I could have seen more internal stuff. I don't know if he ended up doing any internal stuff or not. And there's a lot of Bill Sienkiewicz in here. This is all from the Conan 1984 calendar. So these are original painted pieces because that's the way that he works well, whenever he did covers. Now see, that, that definitely... Well, it looks more like Arnold Conan than John Buscema's Conan. And it's weird to say that because um, it wasn't really John Buscema that kicked it off. I love that. It was uh, Barry Winter Smith. And here's, of course, the painted covers he did without the text. Steve Hickman. This is the cover I was talking about with the booby tigers. And this is original art right here. And I was just talking about this guy, the Bower of Souls. And then in case you don't have the standard edition omnibus, you can have the piece all the way in the back, the one by Nick Klein. Uh, as far as the binding and build of this one, 1,056 pages. Again, $150 retail price. Uh, printed at the iMac printer. But the paper that they've used on Conan lately has been thicker than the paper stock they've used uh, in some of their other books that they've printed. Um, it, this is a reminder of why I fell in love with Savage Short of Conan. And like I said, while the Kurt Busiek Dark Horse was my introduction to the comics and then I fell in love with Roy Thomas's original Marvel years, Savage Sword is just where they could tell the stories I felt like they wanted to tell without any kind of restrictions. You want to show that? You want to show decapitation, people's arms, legs getting maimed, quartering, whatever you want to show, nudity, sure. Conan waking up with a bunch of ladies, all right, let's do it. I felt like that's the kind of stories they were telling in here. And it seems like the creative teams just had more fun. I felt like John Buscema had a lot more fun with this uh, than he did doing the original or the, the comic book adaptation. Uh, so that's why it kind of became my favorite. Like looking at it, I think I'm going to miss this one because what this, I mean, yes, Titan did pick up the rights to it and, you know, they're going to probably continue it, but I don't know exactly how they're going to continue it. I don't know if they're going to make big books like this. I don't know if they're going to be soft covers or if they're going to be oversized hard covers or maybe they'll even do magazine size, but it's just going to be different. And I, I hope that they give it the love and attention that Marvel did as far as these particular collections, because I feel like this book, the way that it was just done shows how much love and care can come through in an end product. But I guess that's all I can say about that. Um, oh, no, wait. I guess I got to do one more thing. Boy, this feels really weird to put this here finally. But here they all are, volumes one through eight, until we get to find out exactly what Titan's going to do, or until the day Marvel gets the rights back to these books. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this book, don't forget to check out our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by... CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this omnibus. Let me know in the comments down below if you are picking this up, if this is the way that you've been getting Savage Sword of Conan, if you were hoping for an epic collection, and yes, if you hope to continue collecting Savage Sword of Conan, uh, no matter what Titan decides to end up doing. I mean, we could get oversized hardcover collections. Uh, haven't gotten an answer from them yet, but I guess stay tuned. But this is it for now. 
until Marvel gets Conan back one day. This was the Uncanny Omar. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.